Hey everybody, it's Tom, and I'm coming to you today to follow up. Uh, pardon the shakiness here of the phone, but uh, and I never know, as I've mentioned on other videos, where to look when using this phone. Um, you know, it's kind of like looking into a camera. In any event, um, <laughs> we're carrying on with the, the phenomenal essay of Gunther, Gunther Anders, uh, the world as phantom and as matrix and we're getting into the second chapter of that text and uh, whereas in the first chapter we stuck with the format of basically just going a section at a time we're going to maybe assume a slightly uh, more celeritous pace here we're going to go in more of a more of a trot than an amble as it were um To recapitulate some salient suggestions of the, well, the most salient suggestion to be recap, uh, recapitulated here from the uh, first um, chapter is that our relationship with the world is radically transformed when we receive that world through the medium of broadcast, whether that be in radio <coughs> or television, <coughs> or I think now even more radically through the vagaries of the <coughs> internet. <coughs> <coughs> this theme is basically the uh, The, 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 the elaboration of the second chapter of the text, which interrogates the category of the phantom. The event of the world itself becomes a phantom or phantasmagoric. What do we mean by that? Well, we can begin by questioning whether the events that we encounter through the medium of broadcast are in fact present to us. And this was a, a set of propositions that we had already covered in, in the first chapter, but we're going to revisit them here as well. There is, as Honors puts it, an ontological ambiguity to those events. What is the character of that ambiguity? Well, I actually would say that there are multiple levels, but the first and perhaps most sort of straightforward of those levels resides in that we lose the impression of reciprocity. The event comes to us, but we cannot ourselves engage in the event or the context of the world from which that event emerges. This is radically disempowering. Uh, and as Anders puts it, it actually situates us in the attitude of the slave because even though we can listen to the event, when we speak to it, the event is deaf and blind to our presence, to our voice, to our assertion. On the other hand, because the event is something which is unfolding at a distance, we are granted a kind of invulnerability. We can superficially it seems encounter the event without having to suffer the consequences of actually being involved with the event now of course that is obviously not completely true because merely to encounter the event through television or some other medium is to be in a position of emotional Vulnerability. In fact, something really is at stake here. As we have noted in pointing out the powerlessness that is implicitly imposed on the listener, the viewer, the recipient. Right. So this is one level of the ontological ambiguity of the event. Its effect on our relationship to it and the world by extension. There is an additional ambiguity 
which is an, ambigu an ambiguity not merely of the event, but this pertains to the, uh, the very concept of the present, or what do we mean when, by presence? And this is a deeper, and in a sense, a more important ambiguity. I don't know if it's more important. It sort of underlies and is connected with this ambiguity that we've already sketched. And that is the ambiguity of the present itself. What do we mean when we say present or presence, right? What do we mean when we say an event is present to us? Well, on the one hand, we mean that we are engaged with a concrete set of circumstances in which we and other people in the world are all connected and tied up in an unfolding process where all variables ramify together. This you might call the sort of concrete, almost tempted to call the spatial aspect of the present because there is a suggestion of a certain immediacy there. But the other, on the other hand, there's the temporal aspect of the notion of present where we're talking about mere formal simultaneity is, is, is the phrase that uh, the honors uses, right? In a sense, the present is that which is occurring in the universal now, right? So what is transpiring at 323 in Zimbabwe is also present in Shanghai, is also present in Cincinnati, is also present in Alpha Centauri. Of course now, what has happened is that we've imported a particular sense of temporality. The abstract temporality of Newtonian, Galilean, Galilean, math, <coughs> Galilean mathematics and so forth and so on. And here there are issues which would take us beyond the uh, purview of this specific sort of summary that we're trying to get to in this video regarding uh, what Anders is sketching, right? And we may, in fact, be compelled to revisit our relationship with temporality, with time. It may actually become a far greater moment than we had initially anticipated at uh, the outset of this essay. And I say that not with respect to the content of the essay, but with respect to what is philosophically germane to the matter at hand. All right. So all that being said, to return, to recapitulate, the very notion of present is itself ambiguous because there is the present of what is at hand, like I'm present in this room looking at this phone, there's a table in front of me, and so on and so forth. You're watching this somewhere concretely. You might be at a desk. There could be a pencil at your hand. There could be someone else in the room. You know, there's an, uh, the, an infinite number of very specific circumstances in which you are encountering this relay. There's that presence. And with that presence, there's a president, presence, by the way, to your own body, your own embodiment, your own concrescence. But then there's the notion of that which is present is that which can be subsumed under a universal now, which is an abstraction, which actually is ahistorical. The suggestion of honors is that broadcast media compels us to weight this latter notion of the present. And in that waiting, in that emphasizing, because what happens is the event is broadcast, it becomes displaced effectively from its situation, its specificity. And then we sort of alluded to that in the previous chapter, how this reframing of the event lends itself to the logic of commodification. But we're not going to get into that here. In the second chapter, we're going to take the different tact. And the different tact is that um, that tact of the manner in which it affects our own subjectivity. And the avenue, or one of the major avenues through which it affects our objectivity 
is that avenue through which it invites us into a different relationship with time and the moment. Relationship with time and the moment, which actually robs the moment of its potency. It's a kind of hypnosis, really. So these are the points which he has covered in sections 11 and 12. In section 13, he is going to elaborate upon the, even though he labels it as a, as a, as a, uh, as a detour, as a kind of aside, I, I feel it's actually sort of important to the overall structure of the argument. He goes into at a greater length the uh, divisive quality of this shift. And I want to return to that in the next video. But there's an additional point which needs to be raised. It's almost an aesthetic point before we wrap this up today, covering sections 11 and 12 of the second chapter. It's actually, just to be clear, by the way, like the, I'm not skipping the first 10. The first 10 sections are chapter 1. And chapter 2 opens with section 11. Um, And that's the nature of the image. Because someone, or the rejoinder, which is forthcoming, is like, look, you're getting all worked up over these broadcast events. You this, this, uh, you're being detained by this preoccupation with the question of presence or absence. What we have to simply understand is that these are images that are being transmitted. And once you, you know, understand that they're images, that they're mere objects of, uh, the um, aesthetic attitude, then you can relax because you're no longer going to be caught into this gnarl of apprehensions that you're being displaced from an appropriate relationship with time. Because the notion of the image is the following. You don't have to be caught up in the question of time because you can just assume that with all images or aesthetic representation. There's a kind of temporal disjunction, is the term honors uses, between the image and its, uh, if you like, its referent. And this can occur along different temporal vectors. The image can recall or reconstitute an event of the past to preserve and reassert it in the present, it can sort of establish a historicity, like a monument, or contrary-wise, it can elicit from a potential future and if, as, a, as a model uh, something which is not extant properly or it could even in a sense be uh, sort of uh, trying to draw us out of time in a kind of transcendent way but in any event we know that when we're dealing with an image we're dealing with something that invites us to understand the extension the extended nature of time Whereas, with broadcast media, the claim of the broadcast is that there is no temporal disjunction. The event which is transmitted is an event is, is transmitted in the very moment which it also in which it also disappears. It arises and disappears. There's a kind of simultaneity. It compresses our sense of time, compresses our relationship with the event to merely the relationship of now. And so we cannot take refuge in, the, uh, in an aesthetic relationship to the broadcast because that's not how we're going to be inclined to relate to the broadcast. Rather, we're inclined to relate to the broadcast, not as a piece of art, but as a way of escaping, if you like, uh, the bounds of our spatiality so that we can go to a football game without going to the football game. So we can know what's going on in Vietnam without going to Vietnam. <laughs> And, you know, you can sort of even, it just, it just occurred to me, you can even look at uh, how the same thing happens through privately available uh, surveillance technology, like the ring bell. Like, oh, I can see who's on my front porch without actually having to be home. 
you know. And, you know, they're superficially, you like uh, events that can be, <laughs> um, you know, there's a utility to that kind of tact. But it's actually deeply uh, corrosive. It's, 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 it affects, and I would say, it, 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 it perverts our minds and, and, and puts us out of touch with who and what we are. It also creates other sort of, you know, senses of, of false security. And I can go on about it at any event. But this is an important point. This is an important point that we cannot understand broadcast uh, phenomena uh, in an aesthetic fashion. Or when we're understanding them as an aesthetic fashion, we're actually no longer construing them as broadcast phenomena. The latter construal is that in which we effectively become hypnotized and disempowered and fractured actually this is this is what we're going to go into in the next video section 13 and a little beyond section 13 where um Anders elaborates upon the various manners in which this alternative temporality then lends itself to a, a, a deeply sort of frag fragmentary consequence for the human person. Thanks for your patience. I am going to get all the way through this essay. I know it's been a little bit stop and start, but we're getting there. And uh, all right, that's that for now. I'll talk to you guys sooner rather than later. Ciao.